Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for participating on this webinar uh, series organized by the East, East, uh, East Center, which is the Bass Center for Language Technology. This is the third one presentation. Uh, so the the first two are already available in the in the web page of its. The first one was the, the inaugural uh, uh, talk by Ed, Ed Hobby. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was uh, uh, Kim Jun Cho, and now uh, we have the, the the pleasure and honor of having uh, Ricardo uh, here with us to, for for presenting. Uh, I think a very interesting uh, talk about uh, uh, the bias on social media. I think this is this is a very interesting and hot topic right now. And uh, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce him uh, here in this talk. Uh, Ricardo Baeza is a uh, well, I, I know him since many years. Uh, so I, I think it was more or less 15 years ago, or maybe more when we met in Prague uh, in, a, uh, in a conference and, and we had very good times there with him. It was uh, really nice and, and we, we uh, had a lot of fun there with, uh, with him. So it's a, it, it is a real pleasure to, to introduce uh, you uh, and, uh, here in this, uh, in this talk. He currently is a research professor at the uh, Ross Institute Index of for Experimental Research of uh, uh, Northeastern University. He is also part-time professor at the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and University uh, Universidad de Chile in Santiago. And he has been uh, uh, vice president of research at Yahoo labs in Barcelona, Spain, and also in California for many years. And he has been also co-author uh, of the uh, one of the uh, reference book on, on information retrieval, which is a modern information retrieval textbook published by Addison Wesley. And uh, he, he had, uh, well, this, this book is a reference in, in the area. So he is uh, uh, also a founding member of the mm -hmm of uh, the, the Chilean um, Academic Engineering Society and, well, many, many other honors. Um, so, yeah, so I share here. So this is his, uh, his uh, short CV. <coughs> and, well, he's an expert on web search and data mining and information retrieval and also on bias in AI, AI, and also is a member of the of the expert group of uh, in Spain of artificial intelligence. So he's a real it's a real pleasure for me to introduce you here in this uh, presentation. So uh, now I think it's your turn. I, I hope this presentation is going to be well. You 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 the, the one you showed just a minute before which is this one. And yeah, th that's, thank you. Thank you. That's all. Thank, thank you for my, my, my turn. So thank you very much for accepting to present your work here and when you want. OK. So okay. thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I will talk about biases in social media data. I already see that, that um, there, there are some issues on the presentation because um, maybe they're not com completely compatible uh, with PowerPoint, but I will try to, to, to use it to see if it, it works. Um, so this is the, the uh, agenda. I see that it's showing things that are not in my presentation, so I'm worried that that this will not work. No, so I, will, I will switch to, to sharing an application. See if that works because it's, okay. this is not exactly. No problem. If you want, sorry, Ricardo. If you want to sh to present by, not not the the, the upload the presentation, but just sharing the screens, that's okay, if, as you wish. Yeah, I will do that because. Um, uh, if there are animations, things like that, yeah. No, no, but also because it's showing things that are already deleted. 
<laughs> and they are not in in the presentation, so I don't know why it's taking it's taking information that is already deleted. So, uh, okay, can you see it? Can you see it now? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. So this is the the agenda. We'll talk a little bit about bias and big data. Then. I will talk about uh, the status of internet and social media in the world. Then I will focus mainly on Twitter data, for the example. I will briefly give uh, just uh, the case of Chile, which I know very well. Um, I didn't have time to prepare the Spain. Um, and then I will go in detail in a particular uh, issue that is uh, how representative is this, this data. And then because Sorry, I know many people I here. Yes? Sorry, can you? I think uh, it's better if you share the presentation because we are just pres you're only having a seeing the the first one. Okay, let me try again because I'm sharing the the let me share, share a, a window then the entire screen to make sure okay. that because we were uh, no. only seeing the first one ah, right now. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. And, and and now you see the, the animation? Yes. Yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Very well. Uh, so, so uh, and to end, I will, because I know that many NLP, NLP people here will talk about the semantic biases in the data. And then I will uh, finish with some visualization biases. So I will try to cover all possible bias in, in, in social media data. Uh, are you seeing the what is bias uh, slide now? Yes. Okay. Then then it's working. So so we so let's start with uh, trying to to have a common understanding for bias. So typically there are three ways to to talk to to talk about bias. One is statistical. So basically, statistical is when you do a measurement but you have a reference value and then you have some inaccuracy and that that um, uh, deviation, which is always a systematic deviation in one direction, that's what is called bias. One problem here is that sometimes we don't know what is the reference value. So for example, we don't know how many women should be uh, in this presentation. Should be 50%? Probably. But really there are no studies that corroborate that, for example, this topic is a gender balance. Um, then you have a cultural bias, which is uh, encoded in your language, encoded in your education, encoded in your religion, in your culture. And, and of course, this is the societal societal bias. And then you have cognitive bias, which is the, every person's cognitive bias. And there are many of them. Here it's only showing the, the, the main 20. Uh, one that is very important these days because it's affecting uh, politics is confirmation bias. You see something that is aligned to your beliefs, and then you believe it. But of course, there are many more. So you can find in the in the web this uh, cognitive bias codex with more than 100 bases that the psychologists have uh, defined. Now, uh, a disclaimer. There are many numbers that we don't know exactly, so they are estimations. So th those numbers may have some bias. So as I'm talking to bias, I have to do this disclaimer. But I think, nevertheless, the main uh, goal of this presentation is to make you aware of your own cognitive biases, because those are the most dangerous ones. And I'm using uh, data from We Are Social and Hot Suite um, from last year. Probably the last data appeared uh, last January, but, but it's not free yet, and, and I didn't check it. So let's talk about uh, big data first. So here you have the, the five Vs that, that big data has to fulfill. So volume, variety, velocity, veracity, and value. Uh, by chance, it works in Spanish, so it may, may work in other languages. Um, I divide the, the, the issues in three. So these are my own taxonomy. So one is the data issues, then you have computing issues, and then you have human issues. I will not go to in detail to, to all these uh, 
uh, cells, but you see that bias affects the three columns, affects data, affect, affect algorithms, and affect, of course, uh, people. So that's why it's so important. Now, if we, if we try to imagine the long tail of data, it will be something like this. So I'm sure you have seen another uh, power law before. And here you have data volume on the vertical axis. And let's say you have organizations or people in the horizontal axis. So basically, I'm saying here that most organizations uh, have little data. For example, we have normal data, small data, or you can say it's also scarce data and, and expected data. And the same happened with people the other way around. Most people generate little data, and some people generate a lot of data. So these are the, say, here on the left will be the influencers. And we will go back to that. That's why this graph is so important. But the main part here is that more than 90% of the institutions will never have big data. So we should focus on small data, not big data. Now, uh, a bit more than a year ago, this was the status of uh, uh, internet in the world. So basically, the penetration of internet was almost 60% here in, in blue. And of those, uh, a big percentage of them were in social media. So that at that time was almost 50%. And today, surely more than half of the people that live in the earth have access to some kind of social media. Now, these numbers are biased to, to exposure and to economic bias. So economic bias, because you need money and, and, and and a certain level of uh, income to have internet and also to have time to use it. But of course, in some cases, you are not even exposed. Uh, and this is the problem. For example, if there's no internet in your region, doesn't matter how much money you earn. And this is the more or less the current status of internet users in the world. You see that the contribution is very different. So half of the internet users are in Asia. So Asia contributes without counting the Middle East to 50%. Of, and then uh, the next large region is uh, not North America, it's Europe, 16%. So basically Asia and Europe is a two, two thirds of the internet population in the world. And of course, this has geographic bias and that's not a strange. Uh, because the internet penetration is different by region. So here you see the different penetration in all uh, sub-regions of continents, and we can go from 95% in Northern Europe to only 22% in Central Africa. So this is the, the difference, and you see that it's a factor of four here. So four times more access in Northern Europe than, say, in uh, Central African Republic. So here you see the, the, the which are the, the countries with the highest penetration, like Iceland, Kuwait, Qatar, and uh, United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. All, all those are 99%. So you see uh, mainly very rich countries plus Iceland. And then the highest penetration is in North Korea. Nobody knows how many people really have access, external access to, to internet. They have a, a local. Uh, internet. And then you have uh, mainly countries in uh, Africa with the lowest penetration, with the exception of Papua New Guinea. So another important thing when you uh, talk about social media is literacy rates. So basically, can you read what you, what you are watching? And you see that, that the highest one is not in Northern Europe, but it's in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, so former Soviet Union. Uh, and the lowest is again in, in Africa, but it's not Central Africa, it's Western Africa. In, in this case, also depends on if you're a female or a male, but you see in Western Africa, less than half of the females uh, have the right the literacy uh, level. So, sadly, reading and writing does not imply always 
understand the text. So that's a, that's a, you need to comprehend it. So maybe you can read, but you don't really understand what the text is. It says, especially uh, depending if the text is a very uh, literate or not. So for example, that's why we have a simplified Wikipedia uh, for people that don't have a like, high level of English. So this is, of course, correlated with the educational level. And, and, and when I talk about literacy bias, I will talk in this broader sense of literacy. It's not about if you can read and write, it's about that you can comprehend what you are, what you are reading. Now, the, the, the next issue is, is how the information comes to us. Uh, and here is a, is a diagram first draft that basically shows this tone of information that in some sense is an amplified mirror of society. And there are some interesting books that talk about that. For example, uh, Trick Mirror from Gia Tolentino or, or The Oxygen of Amplification by Whitney Phillips, uh, a fellow of Data and Society, a book that you can uh, download and, and read because one is free, so the one in the left. And, and it's a tricky amplification uh, because uh, the good and bad are amplified by, by the web. And then, because of that, misinformation uh, flows easily thanks to low level of literacy bias. And here I have this um, from first draft, which explains the seven types of uh, myth and disinformation so you see it from satire, satire or parody to fabricated content. And, and I, I added here that, that the level of consciousness should go, should in, uh, increase if you go to the right. So for example, if fabricated content, you, should, you are conscious that you are fabricating it. So basically you are, you are evil if you are really doing that. And then uh, a clear world that, 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 that uh, a started first draft defines the uh, three types of information disorder, which is uh, misinformation that is, is unintentional, but it still falls. Disinformation that, that is fabricated. Uh, and for example, you have conspiracy theories here. And malinformation, which is not about information, but it's worse than misinformation because also you have the intent to harm. It's not false. So the worst is this information that you have intent to harm and also it's false. And the question is, how many of your cognitive bias affects uh, the fact that you believe or not in some false information? The same for information, but I think here is the most important one because it's a lot of misinformation. So uh, uh, there was interesting survey about what was the what was the, um, the concern for misinformation? And here you see that on average 56 percent, but uh, for example in Spain it's much higher, it's 68 uh, percent, and, and it's one of the highest in the world. The concern for misinformation, I guess, the political uh, scene in Spain doesn't help. Um, but something just to detail, social media is big data, but the sample may not be because you will see uh, there are some uh, properties that do not have if you have just a sample. So here is a, is a typical graph of uh, popular social platforms. So typical graph that you would find in the web. And most people will be very happy with this graph. Well, it has a, has a problem. Why? It has a Western bias. For example, in China, there are things bigger than Twitter, LinkedIn, or Snapchat that are not in this graph. So if we see the right graph, uh, things change because, for example, in, in, in number five, we have WeChat in, from China. Uh, we have uh, TikTok in number seven, which is now is a worldwide, and maybe now it's uh, very close to Instagram. And you have things like QQ, Kison, Sina Weibo, or Kai Shu that's also, also from China. So when you take the, the top, here 10, you will see that uh, half of them are from China. Now, let, let's to, uh, characterize um, social media. So this is my own characterization. Uh, so 
uh, it's an approximation. Uh, and you see the things that are important to me, for example, how many active users. And, and here you will have two issues, literacy, so basically can the people comprehend what is doing, but also you will have something I call activity bias, or, or it's also called engagement bias, and I will talk about that in, in a little bit. Then you have gender bias. You see that in most cases, males are dominant, but there are some where women are dominant, like Instagram, Snapchat, Sorry, or Pinterest. Yes? Sorry, I think we we lost your presentation oh so, uh, really I, I, yeah we didn't see it now okay one second this is a problem with the this uh, platform i prefer zoom so Good. Now, now we see it. Yeah. Sorry. Then, then as I say, uh, activity bias. I will talk about that in in a bit. But also have uh, gender bias. As I was saying, the three that that have majority women: Instagram, Snapchat, and Pinterest. Then you have uh, age bias, and you see that in in, in only one, it seems that that uh, older people is dominant. is Twitter. In the rest, uh, dominant is uh, young people. Then you have worldwide penetration. You see that no one goes over than one third of the of the penetration, and that means that you have different exposure bias, so, so the possibility of seeing this. And then you have geographic bias because the coverage is different. So in some cases it's worldwide, but China, in other cases only China, and so on. Now, there's another aspect that's interesting, is if the data is public or not. And you see here that, that only things like uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest are public, all, all, all of them are public, if you're registered in the, in the, in the platform, of course, uh, ready to. And the question is, uh, and, and that's why I have a question mark, does public data have different characteristics that, than private data? And really, we, we we don't know that because we cannot see the other half, which is the private data, to compare them. For example, will be fa public face Facebook data different from private Facebook data? Uh, that's not known. Well, it's known for the social platform, but not for us. Now, the, the social media penetration is similar to the internet penetration, but you see here that that is very, very different. So it goes from 71% on Eastern Asia to only 6% in Central Africa. So very, very uh, small here. So the, like here now, remember before there was a factor of four in internet access. Now we have a factor of uh, almost 12 in, in social media use. So social media penetration is, uh, as I said before, it's like 50% today, but in, 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 in Countries that develop is higher, for example, Spain 62, but for example, Chile is much higher, it's like 79%. So in some developing countries, much higher than, than some developed countries. For example, there you see Arab Emirates is 99%. And here you have the countries with highest and lowest penetration, again, uh, mainly in, in in Arabic countries and islands, the, the main exception is South Korea. South Korea is the country with highest penetration of social media, which is 87%. Uh, and lowest penetration, as we can expect, is, is mainly in Africa. And also countries that have a very tight con political control, like North Korea and Turkmenistan. So, so if you don't know, Turkmenistan has a, a dictatorship. Now, because of what I, all of what I have said, graphic bias is correlated with exposure bias. So, so of course, if you are in the most rich uh, countries in the world, you will be more exposed to, to social bias. And of course, because economic bias is correlated with geographic bias. So if you see these two, these two graphs, you see that, that uh, the, the, the shades 
although it may look different, uh, the, the way that they go down is very similar. So if you, if you look at gender, uh, again, we saw that the, there were more male. Well, this, this is uh, really uh, dramatic in Southern Asia. So this is basically India, Pakistan. Uh, for every woman, there are three men. And this is com compared completely different with Southern Africa, which was a bit of a surprise for me, and Central America, where, where it's uh, very well balanced. Uh, here are the countries with the uh, highest female ratio, like uh, Belarus and Ukraine and Venezuela. And then the opposite, like Yemen, Afghanistan, and mainly countries that, that, that have Muslim regimes. So I said I would talk about activity bias, which is also called uh, participation inequality by Nielsen. So Nielsen said in 2006 that this uh, 99 1% rule. So basically 1% generates content, 9% interact with that content, for example, commenting, uh, putting a like and so on. And 90% basically they don't do anything, they are just watching, they're lurkers. So with one of my PhD students, uh, like five years ago, we asked the following question, which percentage of active users, so basically which part of the 10%, produce 50% of the content. And these are the results, looking at four data sets. A small one from Facebook that was available. 7% of the people did half of the content, half of the post. Then uh, we look at Amazon reviews, where we found that four of the people did half of the reviews. When I saw this, I said, this, this cannot be true. I mean, there, these people cannot have time to do half of the reviews. But of course, there was an incentive that was fake paid reviews. And uh, just one month after we published this paper uh, in hypertext, uh, Amazon started to sue fake reviewers. I don't know if it was because of the paper, but, but uh, maybe there was some causality because it happened one month later. Uh, in Twitter, we had access to a large collection in 2009, and we, we, we uh, measured that 2% of the people did half of the tweets. Uh, there's nothing strange here. This is called ego, the main incentive here. And, and it's really uh, bias. And then we look at all the data from uh, Wikipedia use, and we found that 2,000 people, which is less than 0.05% of the population uh, that use Wikipedia, uh, they, they did half of the content. And they were paid. They were editors. And maybe thanks to that, we have Wikipedia today because no one contributes to something that is half full, sorry, half empty or even empty. You need to see it at least half full. Uh, here you see the dynamics of activity bias that, that is something that we haven't published with uh, Diego. Uh, and you see that in Amazon reviews uh, is getting better. And the last year that we measured, 2019, also was getting better in Wikipedia. So more people were uh, putting content in Wikipedia. And of course, this is a logarithmic uh, axis because this is very small and, and this one is uh, much higher. So let's look at the biases in Twitter. So the first one is exposure bias. And then for the people that is exposed to Twitter, if you are doing some uh, a study, you will do a sampling and you will have a sampling bias. I will, I will detail what is that. And then in the sample, of course, you will have demographic bias. You will have this activity bias or reduction. So the data from every person will be different. Uh, most of them will be very little and some of them will be a lot. And then in the sample, you have geographic bias, economic bias, literacy bias, technological bias. But all these are highly correlated because they come from the same roots, mainly economy. So if we go just, we look at Twitter, uh, the female representation is worse than in general. So it's only 38% are, uh, are females. Dimension. And then the, the, the coverage of the world population will be, let's say, 6% today, which is low. 
it's still 6% of um, almost 8 billion people. Um, uh, it's a lot of people, it's like uh, almost 500 million. Now, if we look at the, at the audience reach, uh, and this is the definition that is different in every, in every social platform, basically the audience reach is how many people they count to see, to advertising. So that that really makes a difference to put an advertising uh, or not. And here you see that Spain has a reach of 18% of the people for advertising, and this is a bit better than Chile that has about 16%. So, so uh, this is because uh, Spain is more developed and then they have more people that can afford, let's say, click and buy something on internet. Worldwide, it's very low, 6%. Now we'll, I will uh, skip these, are the, the rich rankings, but the Spain is in number 11. So basically you can reach for advertising 7.5 million. And then, uh, Let's look at the sampling biases. So the sampling biases uh, are, are many. The first one is that if you're using the Twitter API, so you don't, you don't have access to a firehose that, that you have to pay, basically it's everything, that's a sample. We do not know how, how is that sample exactly. For example, uh, we know it's filtered. So for example, adult content goes away, a hate content goes away, and so on. Maybe even some languages are filtered, so that's not a, a fair sampling. Now, the second problem with sampling is how we select tweets. People mainly use hashtags and, and keywords, but for example, if you're using hashtags, you already have a literacy bias sample, sorry, a bias, literacy bias, because many people don't know what are the right hashtags. Many people that don't use Twitter too much don't use hashtags. So basically, this this will basically discriminate uh, people that has less uh, technological literacy. Now, how many we should select? And here you have a sample size bias. I cannot talk about this, but basically if you use the standard uh, error formula for, for selecting the size of the sample, you will do a big mistake because the formula doesn't work when samples are small, especially when you're measuring something that is close to zero. So if you're measuring something that is, uh, let's say, than 10% frequent, you should use a, a better formula, and there's some that, that are used for, for, let's say, binomial distribution. And also the content, as I said, is not uniformly distributed because of the activity bias. So, so some people will be overrepresented depending on which content you select. And again, a static sample of big data is not big data because it has no velocity. The, the data is not a, a stream of, of data. Now, if we look at the, at the audience, and here we have it separated by ages and gender, we can focus just in the middle. So mainly you have young people from 25 to 30 years old, where for every woman, there are almost two men. So, so this is the, the, the problem. There's a male dominance and a young people. And you will see why that, that is important when you're using this data. So here you have the highest female ratio, which is some surprises like Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. So uh, basically in, in this uh, far Asia, Asian countries, this is uh, females who like to use it. And in Africa, it's more males. Now, if we look at activity bias in Twitter, activity bias in Twitter is the most balanced one. So this is my own estimation. Instead of having this 99, 1% rule, we have a 58%, 41%, 1% rule per day. So basically every day, uh, about 42% of the people do something in Twitter. At least they put a like. And so about 58% are just watching. Of course, this dynamic set is changing with time. We uh, did this a bit more uh, detail for Chile and Argentina. So you see that this is the popular distribution of users versus tweets. And it's a, it's a log log graph. So you see uh, all a perfect line for Argentina, not such a perfect for, uh, for Chile, but you see the power law. And for example, for, for, for the Chilean, uh, 
the, this rule will be a bit better, it will be 58%, 40%, 2%. So there are more people that contribute to, to the content. Now, if, if we look at uh, just an example of, of the different number of users in a country, I have only this for Chile, but I didn't have time to do it for Spain. But you see that the penetration is quite high, 82%. Um, of the 82%, 96% have social media, so almost every people uses social media. So in some cases, implicit is WhatsApp, but in other cases, explicit like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So what are the demographic biases here? So I, as I said already, first, the, there is a gender and age. For example, if we look at the segment here, the 25, 34 years old, and you can add these numbers very fast, well, you see that the 16% of the population is here. But if you see the, 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 the bars here, uh, they are the double, 32%. So basically, there's a double more young people than, than, than should be in Twitter. But also, the same is true in other things. So for example, salary, this is a, a diagram for, for the, the salary institution in Chile. And here you have uh, the, the limits of these different uh, economic classes that, that are used by the government. And you see that Santiago in the right it's a very segregated city. So for example, uh, almost all the people that is in the top 1% lives on this blue region, which is in the north uh, east, which is on the Andes. Um, by the way, this here, this blue region was the only three in, the, in, in almost all Chile that voted against the referendum uh, last October. And then if we look what are the overall demographic biases, then we can say, okay, uh, there's all the people without internet, which in Chile is about 20%. So these people will not have access, no, no exposure. Then you have all the people that should be allowed to use uh, social media, which in Chile is 14, in other countries, are, uh, but of course people and, and, and create an account before they are 14, but most uh, children are not exposed to this. Then we have older people that, that basically are not uh, native uh, people, and then many of them do not use social media. And then you have, for example, that you have more uh, so we need, we need to take out a chunk of the female part. And we have people that uh, use it for other reasons. Uh, and you see that then this is not a real sample. So the question is, can we mitigate these biases just on, on, on seeing the content? And the answer is yes, partially we, we can do it. And basically what we can do is to segment the sample and weight accordingly each segment. So for example, we, we segment by gender, by age, and we look at census data and we take the right weight for every segment. One problem is that if we have more segments, we have less demographic bias, but we have more sampling bias. So we shouldn't segment too much because then we have problems with the sampling. And also we need to decide the segment without looking at the data because then otherwise we are doing, you're, we're doing pig hacking, we're doing cherry picking. And now the problem is that we don't know the gender, we don't know the age in most cases. So we need to do predictive classifiers to basically assign user segments uh, and then be able to do this. So, so this is our generic, generic methodology for, for uh, doing this, where, where the main part is here, where you have a demographic classifier and that classifies demographic attributes. And then you have the stance classifier, which is whatever you are trying to measure and trying to make it representative by doing this uh, segmentation process. Uh, to give you an example, um, I will show you a, a work we presented last year at, at the at, um, at the Web Science Conference, but we had a version on it on, on also the, in, in the web conference. So, so we had two different papers. 
and we look at the abortion law in Chile and Argentina. So basically, we wanted to see the social media influence within each country uh, through the discussion of the two laws. At the end, uh, the Argentinian law took longer and, and was just approved uh, a few, like two months ago. Uh, the Chilean law was approved earlier, but of course the Chilean law had many more and more conditions than the, the Argentinian law, which is more similar to the Euro European abortion law. So the questions that we wanted to ask to answer was how representative was the discussion and what we can learn from it. So if we look at the discussion, uh, first we need to do this uh, segmentation, and this is what we presented uh, last June in the Web Science Conference. And you see here, that you have people that self-report, so in, in, in orange, self-report, you see that the, the, the segment that self-reports more is the 18 to 24. So we are assuming that they are reporting the truth, which may not be true for, say, less than 18. Uh, they, are, they, may, they may not be reporting the truth. Then we can do the, the prediction. So the prediction is the dark orange. So this is our classifiers. Then we can sum this, these two things, and then we get the, uh, the pink one. And then we need to compare the pink one with the real sensor. You see that less than 18, uh, there's like a six time difference here. Uh, but if you go to 18 to four, the difference is like four. And if you go to over 55, it's like six again, but the, similar to young people. So, so the less represented, represented groups are uh, non-adult and people 55 years old or older. And this is interesting also because if you uh, compare with surveys, uh, at least in Chile, you cannot ask a, a survey to a, a person less than 18 years of age. So Twitter allows you to see the, the, the opinion of young people, which is uh, forbidden for, for example, for a survey. Uh, so this is what we did then for Chile and Argentina. Here you see the the total, the, the, the different segments. So female, male, and so on. And you see that the, the, the relations are, the numbers are very different. So here, seems that in Argentina, a lot of people is lying because you have like 35% uh, women with less than 18 years. So it's something that they need to take in account when you do this analysis, if, if, the, if what people are saying is true or not. Now, if we look at the, the opinion, in this case uh, was the abortion. Um, so for example, the probability of opposing abortion rights is uh, larger in men, even after making this data representative, because we know that there are more men. So if they are against, that will show uh, in a non-real way data. And also the probability of opposing increases with age, which is also what you see in reality in a survey. So here you see the different uh, cases of, of the opinion already uh, already, already uh, basically uh, without the, the gender and age bias. So you see that the females are in favor in Chile and Argentina even more. And if you lo go to, to age, uh, depending on the age, the opposition uh, increases for, for example, it's my majority over 40 years old. Now, we did compare this with national surveys and the error of the representative analysis was very close to the truth. So for example, you see here uh, the results for Twitter weighted and, and then the survey and all the results were uh, statistically significant after the correction. Here, what I said, you can get the results for less than a in which is not available for the survey. Now, let's go to the, the, the topic that may be most interesting for you is like semantic bias. And, and, and sure, many of you are using word embed. And I will show you some examples that maybe are well known, uh, but are important. So one of the first one in, in NeurIPS, 
2016 is that finding chi he analogies, uh, basically most of them have a stereotype. Like uh, if chi's a diva, he's a superstar, of chi's a nurse, he's a surgeon. You see these problems too in, in translation. So in Google's translation, also you see these, uh, these issues with uh, semantic bias. Now, one question I ask is, uh, well, most journalists in the US are men because it's a US collection. Uh, is that true? And the answer is uh, yes, about 60 to 70% of the main journalists in the US are men, but also found out that in at college is the opposite. So here we have not only a gender bias that come from the, the, the history, but also we have a gender bias on getting a word as a journalist in the US, if you're a woman. So uh, one year later, one year later of that paper, there was this more, uh, more subtle analysis of uh, gender and ethnic stereotypes uh, on, on word embeddings. And here you see, for example, uh, what are the uh, stereotypes for Hispanic? It's a housekeeper. For Asian, you have some like a conductor. Or for white, uh, it's hard to see someone that maybe blacksmith will be the one that, or smith, that, that, that you think is not a, a good job. But the question is, what else is there? Well, uh, in, in a recent paper, but, but that will appear next month in, in the FACT conference, uh, they argue that language models are too big. I not, will not talk about that because that's about, about uh, if it's worth to chain and, and waste uh, CO2 and money to build these models. But here you see it, for example, the, the last one, the last two that are coming from Google, one has a 1.5 trillion parameters. So that's very close to the size of the text they are using. So I, 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 I'm thinking at what point do you, 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 you worry about overfitting? If you have, let's say, as many parameters as uh, half of the words that you're using. Well, but I want to focus in a recent paper also last, year, last month of a bit at all that shows that GPT-3, and, and, and GPT-3 is the last one that has been made public, 2020, which has uh, 175 billion parameters that has anti-Muslim bias. And for example, here is uh, some completion from GPT-3. Two Muslim walk into A, and this is what the, your input to GPT-3, and then this is the, the possible completions. Into a synagogue with access and a bomb, or into a guy bar in Seattle and started shooting at will, killing five people, and so on. So the question is, is this happens the same for Muslims or for Christians? Well, the answer is no. Uh, for Muslims, uh, the, the, the bias is four more times than Christians. Uh, and it seems that the less violent people in text is uh, people that don't believe in religion because for us it's, it's uh, very low. Or, or for Buddhists, which are not violent, also is very low. So this is a reflection of the systemic bias we have in, in, in text, in web text and so on, and what things we write about. So we are writing more about violence in, in Muslims uh, than, for example, positive things in Muslims, which there are, as in any other religion. So to, to finish, I want to show you also some, some cognitive biases that happen in social media when, when people use uh, titles of news to try to to manipulate people, and this was for something that happened in the end of 2019 in Chile. There was a famous big data report that was done by a Spanish uh, a company that didn't do a really a thorough analysis. And for example, one thing that they detected is that there was an influence of K-pop in, in young people in Chile. And then some people uh, did the connection, the causality connection, that K-pop was basically one of the reasons of the social uprising in Chile. And of course, that has nothing to do with that, but with music. And we know this, but correlation does not imply causality, but many people forget about this. Or for example, there was a famous figure, Mon Laferte, the same. And then again, the causality was that she was one of the influencers for the, uh, the social uprising, but of course, we know that 
to be present doesn't mean to be influent. Again, you're assuming too much. Or for example, that inference does not imply the same message. So for example, if you have foreign influence, let's say people commenting from Cuba or Venezuela, that doesn't mean that they are doing a specific uh, way that they are influenced both ways. For example, there are a lot of uh, right-wing Venezuelans living in Chile and they also are influencing. But we can do it uh, more subtle. And then the next level is, is the perception, is the interpretation of the results. And here I will show you a, a classical example from the, 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 the current Chilean president, but this was in the first time he was president. And he chose this graph with the uh, criminality that goes from 30, 22, and 23, 27%. And clearly you see something wrong in, in the graph. And it's not that it's right, uh, wrong, but basically the, the need, the doesn't start at zero. But of course, if you see this graph, which is the complete graph, the, your, your perception will be different. But we can be even more smart. And Trump is an expert on this. For example, this is a, a tweet for the first impeachment and says, try to impeach this. Basically, all the counties with a Republican majority in red and then you see, well, this is impressive as it's almost all the US. Well, well, but you know, population is not, <laughs> uh, doesn't have uniform density. And if you do the right graph, the picture is completely different. But most people believe on the left in, sp in spite of this manipulation. And even you can do, do it even more subtle. And this is what was happened, what's happened in, the, in this uh, report that was done for Chile, which looked quite right. So let me give you this example. So let's say that, that this is our Twitter uh, people, and, and this is the number of followers of these uh, uh, users. Let's say all the red ones are foreign uh, users. Then I can say, okay, let's take the top 20 and see what is the influence of them. Well, here you are doing cherry picking. Where? Well, in the 20, you are choosing 20. So. Maybe that was completely uh, unconscious, but maybe it was on purpose. Now, if you do the graph of, if you choose top one, top two, top three, top four, and then you compute the number of uh, followers by, of the foreign accounts, then you get this graph. So this is the graph that you do basically top K, and then you compute the percentage. Of course, each time that you get a, a red line, this goes up. Now, 20 is almost the maximum. The maximum is in 19. So the smart will be have to say top 19. Of course, top 19 is already suspicious, so top 20 looks better. But there, the, the inference will be 20.8%. However, you take everything, you take the whole distribution, the, 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 the 250 people that have in this graph, the inference is only 11%. So almost half the, what was uh, reported in this report. So to end, um, and then we have some time for questions, I would like to re uh, put three of my favorite quotes. Uh, the, one, the first one is there are three kinds of uh, lies, lies, dumb lies, and statistics. This was attributed to a UK prime minister of the 19th century by Mark Twain in his autobiography, but the attribution is wrong. So uh, this, this quote in some sense is, uh, is, uh, has the wrong attribution, so it's a half a lie, so kind of a paradox. The second one is from a Nobel Prize in economics that before winning the, the prize said, torture the date enough and it will confess to anything. I have seen many examples of that. And the last one, the best one, is that the easiest people to manipulate will be those who believe in free will. That's in, in the 2018 book by Harari, 21st less, 20, 21 lessons for the 21st century. But I heard a similar phrase from himself in Stanford that said, are the ones that believe that cannot be manipulated and that really uh, is a opening uh, open your mind to, to how uh, faith false news work. And I can take uh, questions, even biased questions, 
but then you will get biased answers. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Very, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, there will be biased questions and possibly biased uh, answers also. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, if anybody wants to participate, just uh, uh, raise your hand with, uh, with, yep, what is that? Somebody, Rodrigo, yep, uh, I, I can give you some, I will make you uh, a moderator, so you can you can ask directly to to Ricardo. Hello. Um, well, thanks very much for the talk. It was very interesting. I have so many questions that I don't know where to start, but I just made a couple of them. Okay. One is because we were trying to do something similar for Basque uh, that is detecting the age with a student of a, a colleague in the group, uh, Joseba, and. We found out that age is, uh, at least in Basque, is almost never present in the tweets, in the profiles, I mean, okay? So you don't know the real, even, even if that is a lie, we didn't have any data about that. So we need to uh, find our way of uh, developing classifiers to actually do uh, age detection. So I'm interested yeah, to you know- Yeah, you think the content, you have to use the content, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So did you did you have to do something like that? That's that's the question. Yes. And then another, and just a comment is uh, like I like you to ask. Just a general comment is regarding the parrots paper um, by Bender et al. Uh, yes. Do you think it, it is it is enough just curating the data, or do we need to do something else? I mean, this is an interesting co uh, point for me. Thanks very much. Okay. So so first question is uh, yes, we we did that. Uh, we have an, another result that is unpublished, and we're trying to finish it for uh, for web science this year. Is that we did something similar for the referendum in Chile. So we we got a prediction of 77 percent in favor of the referendum, and the truth I didn't believe because I said cannot be so high. I said, we have we had something wrong in our technique. But then it was 78%, so we were right. We, we were very close to the final result because we didn't believe the classifiers. So, so you can do that, and of course, you need to use uh, many things. Uh, something very important that, that you can find on, on the web science paper that I mentioned is emojis. Emojis give a lot of information, much, much more than you think. So, for example, with one emoji, you can detect uh, for, if you are in favor or against the referendum in already 80% of the people. So emojis are today even more important than text and than the semantics of the text. So I would recommend you to use emojis and of course to detect, try to detect the language of the tweet uh, because if someone writes in Basque, um, that should be a person that that can, can use that language. And regarding the second, the second, the second question, um, uh, I think we lost Ricardo. <coughs> well, <coughs> just a minute if he's coming back. He's reconnecting, but he's taking a little. Oh, sorry, I... I... Yeah. Something happened here. So it was my problem. Yeah. So I'm seeing that I have an internet problem. So as I was saying, um, regarding the parrot papers, I don't think you can curate the data because we're talking about trillions of words. I would say that, that uh, we need to work. F so we need to. F so if you're if, if, if by curating the data, you mean mitigating the bias in the in the in the data? Yes, we have to do that. But also we need to work in, inside the model. So we need to to do something similar that we have done in learning to rank in search in learning to rank. There are models that deal with bias while you are learning. And I think this is what something that you need to, to do in in this case, for example, learn uh, when you are doing violent associations, learn when you are doing uh, hate associations, learn where you're doing like wrong gender associations and so on. 
So you need to put semantics on the model. And this is something that we need to do. We cannot use just uh, brute force deep learning. We have to use hybrid techniques that combine deep learning with, with uh, say, uh, semantic models and, and knowledge bases. And for example, I'm sure you know that deep learning many times rediscovers what NLP people have already done. <laughs> <laughs> or what people do use like uh, grammars right <laughs> yeah that is true Th thanks very much thank you for, uh, for the presentation again cheers yeah. thank you um further questions more questions comments there is a question in the chat from nils beck that that says since we will never get rid of bias is there a positive end game scenario that you have in mind for the bias in data uh, that's a very good question. I, I, I'm working on, on some ideas, but I don't have like an end game scenario that will be like a, a bulletproof scenario. And, and I don't think that's possible. Humans are biased by nature. Okay, I, I will I try Paolo, to... Paolo has Paolo. a question, I think. Yeah, but let me see where is he. To, ah, uh, here. Okay, sorry. Thank you. So, Paolo, you can now turn on your microphone. Paolo? Yes, yeah. sorry, it's a, it's a digestion time. So, yes, I have to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, hi, Ricardo, thanks for your presentation. Actually, Hi, Paolo, I have to hear you. My, my question is uh, related to the, the bias in one. So, um, yes, I mean, uh, bias uh, represent uh, basically what we have. I mean, uh, stereotypes uh, that are uh, among us. Uh, and uh, so what, is it uh, enough uh, or um, to the bias data in order to feed our models uh, with uh, less bias data or uh, maybe we should uh, also push uh, the counter narrative uh, approach so i mean uh, to uh, to somehow model the diversity in the data also with respect to stereotypes and bias in general but at the same point uh, try to um, come up uh, with uh, you know a counter narrative uh, that is uh, a way to educate, uh, you know, the, the, our social world uh, in another uh, in another possible uh, perspective. I think I think what you're proposing, yeah, I think what you're proposing is a valid is a valid um, approach for biases that we know, like gender, race, religion, uh, sexual preference, um, xenophobia, and so on. But the problem that I think the, these models are learning things that, that are much more subtle than that. I don't have a good example for, for text because I, I, no one has found that, for example, uh, people with uh, X, Y, Z characteristics are, are being uh, discriminated. Let's say we are just looking at the ones that we know, like uh, religion, gender, uh, race. But for example, I have a very good example from uh, the last month's, um, last month's um, a result of the Delivero case in Italy. I don't know if you're aware. Basically, people, uh, uh, people uh, bringing food to your home, and they found that there was an indirect bias because the, uh, the algorithm was discriminating people that couldn't deliver at uh, dinner time yeah. and why was discrimination because some people couldn't deliver uh, at, at dinner time because it's like uh, feeding children feeding uh, old person feeding themselves uh, not wanting to work more than eight hours and so on and this is very interesting because this this um, you need to really explore very well the algorithm to find out that this was a discrimination like dinner time and then people that were able to deliver at that time earned more money and had more work. And imagine something, I, I'm sure that this in text, there are like millions of things like this, that the model is learning these uh, small things that when you do these completions, I, I, I don't know if you have seen other articles about GPT-3, but 
the errors that the, the models uh, do are not human. So basically, most of the time it's right, but when do they do something wrong, it's something that the person will never write. It doesn't make any sense. And some of them is, is harmful. So basically, they're, they're, they're affecting people, discriminating people. Like uh, you put a name, and then the, this person is something bad. Uh, and this is the issue. That, like We are just scratching the surface of all the problems we can have, and, and that's why I, I believe the the, the, the stochastic parrot paper is, is a landmark. You can say that it's an opinion paper, I don't care. Uh, a lot of research in the world has been about opinions. Uh, but but it's, it's something like saying, should we keep spending money generating this, uh, uh, I say, these uh, very sens sensitive models which make these awful mistakes, or we should go back, think uh, ethically, and do everything again better not so not fast this is more like the facebook approach uh, uh, go fast until it breaks it, well now it's broken let's uh, step back okay thank you ricard uh, paolo do you want to uh, make any further question no I think there's one person that that uh, yeah. had the. Yeah, but uh, I think he left. I think. Okay. So, uh, um, well, I, I also have a question for you, and it's, I, I think, think he's back. Uh, he's back, Arturo. Arturo is back. See, yeah. Okay. So I, I will try to to make it mod moderator right now. Say, okay. So it seems that the, when uh -huh. you raise your hand, you leave. The system kicks the person. I'm sorry because I'm connecting with the mobile phone and well, my my fingers are too too wide for managing with the phone. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. It's very interesting and very uh, up to date uh, 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 talk. We are working on on bias with one of our students, and I fully agree with you that this is a matter of first tapping this from the uh, knowledge uh, uh, domain, because uh, uh, it's true that when we are referring to bias, it's, it's, it's first uh, a matter of defining what we consider bias or not, because I mean, the, the model doesn't know about anything of, uh, about it. So I wonder if it's more a, a question of engineering. So when we specify where our application is going to, to, well, to be used, where, uh, which kind of data are we going to, to use for training, which are the goals and the domain where this application is going to work. Then we have to think about uh, having bias in mind, to think about measure, for example, to uh, include certain constraints in the training or uh, the bias in the model afterwards. I don't know, but uh, having some kind of uh, well-defined methodology in order to, de to deal with bias, but from the engineering point of view, instead of having uh, the maybe uh, an innocent idea that we can deal with bias in a more general way. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're right. I mean, I think we need to, to uh, so some people is already worrying about how to, de how to de devise ethical AI systems. And one particular case will be, for example, language models. So how do you really have models that, that uh, at least mitigate this, these problems. So for example, the, the typical, the, there are three typical solutions. One is you bias the input data, which is the, the most effective one for this case, I would say. Uh, but then we're talking about uh, huge amounts of data. So the problem is scalability. The second part, that's why I think it's more interesting is to, to work during the training phase to, to basically the, mitigate the bias. And here we need to, to maybe follow what we have done in search for learn to rank with bias. Uh, they, are, they are the main bias, they are the clicks on the answers. Uh, here it's a bit more difficult, so I'm sure someone will come up with a clever way to, to try to detect, maybe using knowledge to detect all these uh, wrong associations. Um, and the third one is, as you said, the bias in the output, but the problem the bias in the output, you already, you already lost too much information, so maybe if you are not able to debias. The typical example is that maybe you do a LinkedIn search, and then most of the people are men, 
and you want to do gender parity, but there's not enough women to do it because you already deleted all of them or most of them. Uh, and this, this also happens in, in when you process uh, text. Um, one of the main problems that we have on, on the algorithmic side, on the middle, which I think is the most uh, interesting to, to advance faster, is that um, today also we have we see amplification of bias, not only not only uh, keeping the bias, the systemic bias you find. There are various cases are applied to, to to justice, where, for example, the system is more racist than all of the judges, and didn't have any demographic data. So, so it's learning is learning the amplification from the, the 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 related data like the case. Uh, if you're interested in this, I'm giving a talk tomorrow in the UPF, which is open. It's, a, it's an, on ethics and AI, and I will talk about other problems with biases and, and AI systems. I think Berta, Berta has a question. Yes. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, has been very, very interesting. I'm a social psychologist. I don't know nothing about engineers and things like that, but I'm working with Paolo Rosso in in stereotypes and and so on. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that you said mm, we need to put semantics in the model in order to detect the bias. And just we are realizing that we need to put also narrative in the in in, in not in not in the semantic sense sense of words. Uh, narrative in the sense that uh, people cost, uh, build a frame uh, a frame that is very subtle in terms of discrimination, but is very effective in terms that if you put a group always in the middle of a frame that speaks about uh, something uh, like violence or illegal uh, entries in mm -hmm. the country, without using attributes, without characterizing the group, you are uh, creating a a bias. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But would you say that the narrative is not a semantic template for 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 a certain goal? In because some like, sense, uh, when I read mm -hmm. your when I read the, the jobs that you publish uh, with your community, I mean, not you. I mean, when I read the mm -hmm. the papers that you, how do you use words? How do you use dictionaries? How do you use engrams? These kind of things. I think that there is something that is uh, more difficult to to capture. That is uh, that people are telling a, a story, a whole one. Uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, human uh, brain is not a doesn't use doesn't use concept, but tell stories. Uh, yeah, and, and those stories have a lot of cognitive bias. Exactly. I mean, the point is maybe to maybe to move from uh, I mean, not emphasize not to emphasize in attributes in in characteristics things like that, but also in in which in the middle of which stories we put people. Yeah. So 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 well, I haven't looked at that narratives too much, but what I'm I, I guess trying to say what you're saying in a different way. I would say that. Maybe um, for f maybe like trying to not to forbid some narratives also helps avoiding the bias in spite that you don't still don't have semantics. Exactly. So this could be another another syntactic level, but it still will be syntactic level. Uh, yes, this yes. Is, uh, part of the problem. It's language. I mean, it's yeah. language. But it, I would say I would say that it's a more like a structural level. So yeah. so it's, it's basically you're looking at the structure of the narrative to see that that basically doesn't frame people, for example, in some way. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting comment. Thank you. So if um, there are no additional questions, I have only one. Well, but it's not a question, it's just a comment. I think you also, in your presentation, was also biased. So the, the categories you were using, the gender, for instance, male and female, or about ages is uh, is your decision. So you you partition the, the the data on countries or thing like that. So it's, it's when you uh, you try to 
the bias you buy your bias you are biasing also because of your your categories and your your selection so there is no no neutrality there is no it's impossible the data is biased you are biased everything is biased so yeah, I, I agree with that, but but remember, bias. We, we have the bias to to think that bias is negative when we talk about bias. That's another bias, <laughs> because bias can be positive, right? Like there yeah. there are affirmative actions, there are positive discriminations, like for example in gender. But but this is a good point. So I'm using I'm using these categories because these are the ones that are accepted by society. So I, I have to use some cultural bias to explain the concept. For example, otherwise you have some paradoxes like. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I need to check it, but I think in France now they are not asking for race information. But then if you don't ask for any race information, you cannot uh, uh, see if they are doing, uh, uh, the, if they have racist bias. And then maybe even more rampant. So the, the bias will maybe be more rampant because no one is, is basically, uh, no one is uh, collecting this date that I do with you is it's a completely by for example I believe race doesn't exist so 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 race is, is yes it's a it's a western construct at uh, the same we know that this uh, uh, gender is non-binary so all these things but basically but we have the problem that we need to to be able to to explain this to many people that doesn't agree on these things so so yeah mm -hmm. it's complicated I agree too. Well, I'm really complicated. I think that uh, the topic is really complicated. So I we really appreciate your 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 presentation. I start thinking on all these things about the data, which is not only on on natural language processing, but it's uh, everywhere. I think it's every every time we we are processing data. No, we are having pictures or whatever. No. So thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you, uh, Ricardo. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Uh, I will present right now the, sorry for, we are getting late, so so my presentation finished here with uh, just to know that uh, there will be an, the next session on with Irina Gurevich on March 4th, so in, in the next month. Uh, again, uh, it's uh, on Thursday, mm -hmm. Thursday also at the same hour, so uh, we wait for you. And there is a web page here for webinars uh, where you can you can also register if you want. So thank you once again, and see you next session. Thank you, and uh, we stop uh, the the recording.